Hi, welcome to the GAI online discussion series. I'm here today with Doug Melamed. Doug's professor of the practice of law at Stanford. From 2009 to 2014, Professor Melamed was senior vice president and general counsel of Intel. And prior to joining Intel in 2009, he was a partner at Wilmer Hale in Washington, DC. And prior to that, he was uh, served in the US DOJ in the antitrust division as acting assistant attorney general. Doug, thanks for coming on and talking to me today. Pleasure to be here. So I figured we would uh, kind of pick and choose topics and have a, a, a good time talking about the state of antitrust generally. Uh, but I figured a great place to, to start and in particular, because I know you've got um, forthcoming work on this topic is the various new criticisms aimed at modern antitrust doctrine, and I think fair to say uh, antitrust institutions as well, sort of more broadly at the enforcement agencies. Um, some of these from the uh, neo Brandeisian, um, what I've described as hipster antitrust uh, direction, um, others from, from, from sort of other places, but lots of discontent uh, with modern antitrust doctrine and institutions ranging from oh, we've got uh, congressional proposals to do away with the consumer welfare standard, um, some more modest uh, reform proposals uh, that would move presumptions and burdens around, um, all sorts of uh, combining agencies, all, all sorts of proposals that are, are around. And I thought a good place to, be, to, to start would be to get your sense of the various vectors of criticism uh, sort of levied at current antitrust law and institutions and, and figure we can, we can figure out uh, where to go from there. Sure, I mean, I, I think, uh, and the, the future work that you referred to, I think spells this out, um, there are really two conversations going on. One is with, uh, among people, uh, conservatives and liberals and progressives and centrists alike, who are uh, taking as a given uh, the, um, the kind of normative objective of the antitrust law, the singular focus on economic welfare, which is captured in the, in, in the, in the term consumer welfare standard. And then having a discussion about whether that, whether antitrust doctrine or process within that normative framework should be adjusted to better to serve um, this objective. I think there's a very separate conversation. Um, uh, what you'd call hipster antitrust, neo Brandeis populist, uh, has a lot of different labels. Um, and I think that is really um, a, 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 an argument that antitrust law should not be exclusively focused on economic welfare, that it should instead take on bigger issues of distribution, uh, unequal distribution of income, wealth, economic and political power. Now, some of the early papers from the neo Brandeis folks. Uh, attempted to argue that uh, the consumer welfare standard didn't well serve even the uh, economic goals of antitrust. I think the, I, uh, Nicola Petit and I wrote a couple of papers, others have written in response to that, and do have. Um, I think those arguments by the new Brandeis folks are very, very weak. I think it's all wrong. Uh, the arguments that the consumer welfare standard is all about price, it's not about uh, uh, buyer side problems, it's not about them. Um, uh, uh, innovation uh, and sort of non-price competitions are just all wrong. And to me, the telling thing is that after those criticisms were made, I haven't seen the new Brandeis people defend that position. And I think that's because that was a political argument, frankly, an effort to motivate people to buy into their larger agenda. But the real agenda is antitrust law ought to be addressed at issues of dividing up the pie, not just issues of growing pie. Um, now, personally, I, I, um, I think we do live in a gilded age. I think we have some serious problems of, of inequality and that uh, public policy ought to be uh, uh, seriously considered aimed at you know, rising policy in an effort to address those concerns. Uh, but I don't think antitrust law is, is the right way to do it. I think it's, uh, it's an effort by the new Brandeis folks to uh, harken back to an earlier and unsound tradition. And by the way, it wouldn't even solve the inequality problem very well because case-by-case -case adjudication, you know, break up Google, what's that going to do to overall inequality? You know, it's not going to not take power from the devotions and the brothers and so forth. 
So I, I think they're uh, uh, mistaken error. So uh, I too have noticed um, a little bit of a shift in where uh, I'll use Neo Brandeisian also, so I don't get you in trouble for using hipster with me, um, which is, uh, I don't know, uh, people react differently too. So I've noticed a little bit of a shift in the Neo Brandeisian focus as, as, as well. Um, in addition, maybe in addition to the one that you identified. So in the beginning, there were these claims about shifting to a, a public interest standard or something <clears throat> more directly attacking the consumer welfare standard. And there seems to have been a shift. Um, I, I, I too think the sort of the, the papers and arguments going directly at the consumer welfare standard have given way to um, attempts to modify rules within the consumer welfare framework, at least in some cases, um, attempts to go sort of at the consumer welfare framework to get goals that are more consistent with either doing redistribution or, or, some, or something else. Um, one of those shifts that I've noticed that I think characterizes not only the sort of version two of the Neo, or, or maybe it's three, but the, the, the newer version of the Neo Brandeisian uh, criticism, but also some of the criticisms that come from, um, uh, we talked the other, the other day, this, uh, the equitable growth and the 12 year signatory to this letter that went to the house. And there's all sorts of ideas that different people have. I mean, sort of, uh, but some of those ideas are aimed at brighter line rules, right? Presumptions of, illegality to be applied here or there. The neo-Brandeisians, not the folks uh, necessarily in that letter, but the neo-Brandeisians have done that. So open markets as a comment um, uh, that went to the agencies about reinstituting the bright line rules in the 1968 horizontal merger, you know, 10% share uh, per se illegality, just sort of doing bright line structure and getting out of the rule of reason business um, or getting out of case by case adjudication. That seems to be a broader theme that's attracting both the neo Brandeisians than I think sort of more progressive critics of modern antitrust institutions that would not associate themselves with the neo Brandeisians. That seem right to you as a characterization of the state of play? Well, I, I, I hate to see um, uh, the open market people group with uh, some of my friends and myself, I suppose. <laughs> But I regard as antitrust progressives. Um, but yes, I think it's true that, uh, uh, for, for example, some of the people I've, I've written with uh, and submitted, signed a letter to um, the House the Judiciary Committee, um, do think that maybe some movement towards some brighter line rules um, uh, would be a healthy move. But I think there's a big difference between, on the one hand, saying, look, uh, this case by case adjudication is very tricky, it's very difficult. The agencies have enormous expertise and do it pretty well, but, but courts struggle with um, um, Sabre, Fairlocks, the city of this, of course, and Postage House. Maybe that was so extreme. It's not a good example of anything. But, um, uh, I think there's a big difference between saying maybe we ought to simplify and have some simpler rules, um, and sort of the way uh, uh, we have, you know, cliche rules in some situations and negative, uh, you know, defense-oriented rules as well. I mean, like like the predatory pricing rules, the the, the uh, recruit principle was was knowingly, explicitly said we are, we know that anti-competitive price cuts will be tolerated with this rule, but we think it's better than and really trying to sort it out case by case. There's, a, there's an honest discussion, it seems to me, about whether serving the, uh, the objective of economic welfare is better served by some simple rules from time to time. That's very different, I think, from what some of the popular, some of the open market folks are talking about, which is uh, are, are trying to uh, embed in the law a lot of extreme rules that are not intended uh, in my view, to promote economic welfare, but rather are intended to so, yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I think, for example, in the debate over the vertical merger guidelines, you know, I've I've had a debate um, 
you know, exchange of papers with Fiona about characterizing, uh, Fiona Scott Morton about characterizing what the evidence is on vertical mergers. And I, um, despite uh, from time to time, some of the, the, the tone in the exchange, I think we're actually pretty close to, um, hey, the evidence is mixed. Uh, I tend to think it's mixed a little bit more on the more likely to be pro-competitive side. And, um, you know, she would characterize it a little bit differently. And I tend to conclude that in an error cost sort of framework that says we're going to get both some stuff wrong on both sides, uh, the mixed evidence tends towards case by case analysis and doesn't justify presumptions. But there's a there's an honest discussion to be had there um, about what the best approach is, given the evidence and the evidence is going to vary across um, exclusive dealing and vertical mergers and horizontal mergers. And it's almost as if if you really want to take the evidence seriously, you sort of have to have these silos of discussions, you know, what's the evidence on vertical mergers? Okay, what's the right set of rules? What's the evidence on exclusive dealing? What's the evidence on mergers? And you can talk about whether presumptions are, uh, whether presumptions of illegality or illegality uh, are correct. And there's, I think, one part pocket of the antitrust community having, having that discussion. Um, but my sense is, uh, I, I, and I, I don't know if this is right, and it certainly changed over time, but my sense is that the that's not the most prominent discussion going on right now in terms of uh, antitrust reform and policy. And I feel like I'm, um, you know, I'm trying to change that. I I, I think you are of of the same view. But is your impression also that uh, that debate over evidence and rules and presumptions, the kind of debate that we've had in antitrust the last twenty years? Um, that that's fallen by the, the, the wayside? I don't know if it's fallen by the wayside, but there's no question in this day and age that the uh, heat draws light or whatever the expression is. The more extreme, the more controversial uh, arguments are getting more attention, the populist uh, view. Um, uh, and I think that's unfortunate. I don't know whether that will translate into law or whether that's just a public uh, polemical discussion that will give no consequence. But I think it's unfortunate. You know, you, you, you referred a little bit to uh, uh, tensions and, and exchanges that you've had. One of the, it, it's so sad that the, the, the era of distrust and of anger and of partisanship spilled over even into kind of a wonkish, nerdy feel like antitrust. Um, uh, there were a dozen of us who, who as you know, uh, uh, sent a letter into the House Judiciary Committee uh, with respect to pending legislation. And uh, the open markets folks, a couple of them, uh, based on Twitter, not only said, oh, we think this is really misguided, it's, it, it's uh, uh, readjusting deck chairs, well, organic thinking, or whatever you might want to say. They said, and look at these guys. These were Obama hangover, uh, hold on. They were the Obama administration. They're complicit in all the evil of antitrust enforcement. Well, I mean, first of all, as I pointed out to, the, to our group, not publicly, but I'll say it publicly, now four of us were holdovers for the veterans of the Clinton administration. I don't think it was complicit in, in overly lax antitrust enforcement. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the idea that, that even a, a, a a wonkish discussion about antitrust policy should be responded to with that kind of ad hominem effect. It's a sad day. Agreed. Um, so, with respect to that um, that letter and the current state of debate, and um, so not the open market sets of proposals, um, but I think sort of the, the the types of things up for grabs. So that, that House Judiciary letter, you know, that they've got a investigation with respect to uh, digital markets, and there's obviously a lot going on with respect to to digital markets. You know, at the agencies, the Senate's having hearings, the House had hearings, and talks of a, a report of some sort coming out, and um, you know, folks testifying and sending letters and the like, and we've got pending legislation. Um, and I don't think we need to get into the weeds of any of the pending legislation. I mean, I'll, but but sort of some of the general flavor. Uh, maybe we can turn to some of the general flavor of those reforms, in particular, um, aimed at at um, aimed at digital markets. And this sort of runs the. I'm, I'm thinking of a couple that are in that letter, but also some that aren't. 
you know, sort of everything from um, overturning Trinco uh, or Amex or um, presumptions of illegality for vertical conduct for digital platform firms, however we would d define that. Um, if you were to identify, I don't know, well, one or two, so we can um, be sensitive to time, but if you were to identify one or two of areas for reform that you think the evidence tells us now uh, are either ripe for discussion or overripe for discussion, and we ought to be implementing them right away. So what are the highest priority items? And I, I figure that might give us something to disagree on. I suspect it will. Um, let me just proceed that by saying something um, else about that letter. Um, I personally am, am skeptical about the wisdom of legislative involvement in antitrust law. Uh, I, I suppose uh, I, and maybe you and I together, if we sat down, could, could draft a, 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 some a new legislation that might improve things. Uh, whether Congress is capable. Um, a different issue, but it is in play, and I do think it's important for the reason you were referring to earlier about about who's getting the notice, who's getting the attention here. Uh, for those of us who who um, are working within the kind of existing norm of the paradigm, uh, to be at the, in that conversation and not just make it a, a choice between Oculus and you know uh, died in the world uh, establishment variants because. Uh, that's a risky conversation to have. But with respect to that conversation <laughs> in the paradigm, um, I think there are some things that, 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 uh, that ought to be uh, thought hard about. Um, I don't believe Trinco uh, should be overruled. I think Trinco was rightly decided. In fact, I think it's a very easy case. Uh, the issue with Trinco, as I see it, was whether one can be found to have. Uh, uh, violating the antitrust laws, whether whether his conduct meets the anti-competitive element of the antitrust, simply because their conduct violated a non-antitrust scheme. In that case, it was the regulation. The answer to that question, of course not. It's an antitrust question, yes, not a, a communications law. But of course, um, uh, Scalia wrote the opinion, not Breyer, and there was a lot of rhetoric in it. Uh, there's been uh, read in a lot of ways. I think it's gone too far. Um, I think it's a mistake to read that case to mean, and if it, and if it does mean it, to, to, to perpetuate uh, it, it to mean that a prior course of dealing is required uh, as a prerequisite to finding any kind of uh, antitrust. Um, I think it's a mistake to say, as Commissioner Wilson did in her op ed piece after the Qualcomm District Court decision. Uh, that uh, finding a duty to, to deal there was an easy violation of well-established uh, uh, principles since Trinco and Aspen Ski, because the refusal to deal in that case, unlike Trinco, unlike Aspen Ski, was not a standalone refusal to deal. It was in, it was in aid of the unlawful uh, licensing restrictions downstream, um, or, or, or not licensing restrictions, but, but, but the, the uh, no license, no chips policy. Um, uh, so I think we need to uh, uh, try to guess an area. Another area is predatory pricing law. I don't quarrel. I don't quarrel with um, uh, with Brooklyn at all, uh, even though I recognize it, 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 it deliberately acknowledges there will be false negatives. Uh, I think we do need simple rules. Uh, we need predictability in the law. But Brooklyn never said that the only way to, to Prove below cost pricing is A, to look at incremental pricing, even if you're talking about a long term strategy where avoidable cost is a much better measure than incremental cost. Uh, or, as the district and the court and 10th circuit in the AMR case held, if you don't have data directly observing whatever measure of cost it is you're looking for, then the plaintiff loses. You can't prove it by your circumstantial evidence. You can send somebody to jail for murder. On the basis of circumstantial evidence, but the courts are saying you can't prove that by pricing that way. Well, I think I think that in these, these cases that were rightly decided have become kind of ossified caricatures uh, in the lower courts, and some adjustments necessary. And then the third area is merger. 
merger review, where I think it's quite clear uh, a lot of mistakes have been made uh, by the courts and by the agencies. Some of them because of, uh, I think, uh, flawed analytical tools, uh, perhaps in hospitals and maybe in airlines. Uh, but that's not the only explanation. And so there, too, is an area where I think we all answer. Can you? Uh... I think we mostly agree on the Brook Group point. I mean, I think um, the price cost tests have been, I too think Brook Group's rightly decided. Um, one of the really funny features of Brook Group that uh, I've noted in writing, and I think Bruce Co, I think I learned this from Bruce Co Kobayashi, so I ought to, I ought to attribute it to him, who's got a, I think, a really nice uh, summary of the economic and uh, a, a literature on this stuff. It's now, now a decade old, but. Um, was that the discounts in Brook Group were actually loyalty discounts. And so we've got this, in other cases, we've got this big debate of whether you do exclusive dealing, foreclosure style analysis or price cost tests. Um, and one side citing Brook Group to say, you know, you do price cost tests um, and you do a particular form of price cost test. Uh, I think one of the things when I was a commissioner, the, one of the decisions where I got hit hardest from the, from the right was I had written something saying, you don't just get to, um, this is another type of, I think, abuse of Brook Group that maybe cuts the other way. You don't just get to um, shout that my price is above cost in the Brook Group sense and pretend exclusive dealing law doesn't exist, right? There, you know, uh, a plaintiff gets to make out of his claim if the plaintiff's claim is, you know, a foreclosure based exclusionary raising rivals cost claim, then you, you prove those things. And if it's a predation style claim, uh, you, you, you prove that instead, and we have a different mechanism and different economic tests. I do, I do think it's right that um, kind of in both directions, the, the application of price cost tests, both in straight predation claims, but also the attempt to export price cost tests to other parts of the law, I think has been met with a lot of confusion in lower courts. Watch lower courts try to do loyalty discount claims. Um, and I, come I, up I, I, let me just say, I, I can see, I, I meant to, to mention that and slip my mind. I mean, there's another way in which Brook Group has, has unfortunately uh, morphed into something it shouldn't be, and that is the exporting it into the area of loyalty discounts. I think it might be, make, make sense in bundle discounts, but not loyalty discounts, uh, and largely because one cannot say of a loyalty discount what you can say of a, of a simple price cut, uh, you know, paradigmatic uh, Rita Turner story. And that is that as long as the price is above uh, a marginal cost, there's an unambiguous welfare increase. You can't say that about a loyalty discount. So I agree that the price test shouldn't be conclusive or it's maybe relevant. But I, I think I disagree with you a little bit about the use of the exclusive dealing um, as, a, as, as a test. Um, exclusive dealing teaches a lot, exclusive dealing law and analysis teaches a lot about. Um, uh, how one should think about foreclosure. Uh, if I deny you access to X number of customers or uh, Y number of input suppliers, at what point does that really become damaging the competition market as a whole? But what it doesn't help you determine is whether the price incentive was any competitive. Because unlike exclusive dealing where you have a commitment by the buyer or the seller, as the case may be, to deal exclusively with the defendant, in a loyalty discount case, you don't have that commitment. You simply have an incentive, kind of a unilateral contract. Um, and, and that leaves a, a very difficult question, which I don't have an easy answer, which is how do you decide when that incentive crosses the line? Yeah, and this is, this is an area I've got to, I've written a lot about in particular because uh, I think exclusive dealing law gets close uh, and maybe closer than other areas of law uh, in section two and in, in section one uh, as vertical conduct um, to getting close to nailing the, you know, the right sort of set of economic questions. It talks about foreclosure. It talks about you know, foreclosure sufficient to deprive the arrival of reaching minimum efficient scale. It's wary of questions like the, the duration of the contract and, and the like. Um, it's got a preference for um, but not a requirement for, look, we've got these cases where the exclusive dealing contract's been in, in the market for 10 years and it says, well, I mean, we can go the indirect route and measure foreclosure all you want and debate the question over whether we've got enough or not enough. 
But if the restraint's been in the market for 10 years, you know, and your allegation is they reduced output and show me the price, well, you know, there ought to be some footprint left by the restraint. This was largely my dissent in McWayne, uh, which really was a loyalty discount. Um, was really my de my dissent in McWayne is you allege the thing resulted in lower output and higher prices. It's been in the market. We have before and after. Uh, and guess what happened to output? Didn't change. In fact, you know, the growth rate stayed the same before and after. Now, um, the view that looking at that as being, you know, uh, as being dispositive in the sense of showing that the plaintiff didn't satisfy its prima facie burden, obviously, it's a dissent. So, so um, I lost in 11th Circuit dis disagrees. Uh, but I think even in my dissenting position, I think we got it more wrong on the, on, on the facts, but the framework is basically agreed upon. Um, I would wait for exclusive dealing or loyalty discount contracts that have been in the marketplace. Uh, so we're not talking about allegations about innovation or the like, right? They've been there. You can measure the effects. I mean, it was iron duct pipe fittings. There were price and output data. Um, plaintiff didn't bother to put them on, um, you know, you, for, you for know whatever reason. Case, you know that case, Gordon. I'm not going to argue about that case. I, I will say, and maybe this will take us far afield, but not appropriate for today. I don't think that uh, it should be a, a complete defense to say that the conduct did not prevent the, um, the injured rival from reaching efficiency. I think I agree with that. I think I agree with that. I think there are three, four, five ways a plaintiff can satisfy his prima facie burden in those types of cases. Showing that there's foreclosure sufficient to deprive you the opportunity to reach scale, I think is one. Um, yeah. One. Uh, but, there, but there are others, you know, a direct showing of price or output, a showing of a foreclosure percentage that's really high, even if we can't relate it directly to, you know, we can't always minimum uh, measure minimum efficient scale. Sometimes we can. Right, we, we see the scale of a successful entrant or something like that. I think there are lots of different ways to get there. My dissent was really, in that case, was saying, you, you, you do have to satisfy one of them. Um, you know, that's, that's part of the game. Uh, and sometimes that's hard, but that's, um, you know, plaintiffs in all sorts of cases have to prove stuff. And, and that's the stuff we've chosen. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, and may, maybe we'll come back to Trinko, but, um, on the merger front, sort of said that they identified mergers as the third area. Um, you know, my hobby horse on mergers, I think, as you know, is 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 PNB and repealing the thing because it makes no economic sense. There's just not a lick of evidence uh, that suggests that a post-merger share over 30 uh, percent renders it more likely than not that a merger is anti-competitive. Um, and the, I think the people who like PNB don't really mean to support the economic proposition, um, but that's what PNB is, right? PNB is a legal presumption that a post-merger share over 30%, and I've got an article with, with, um, with Judge Ginsburg on this. This is most, how it's most commonly invoked. Occasionally, lower courts mean something looser, like a high enough share, and wave my hands around the number, but way more often than not, it's the sort of literal 30% uh, trigger for the shift. So a post-merger share of over 30%, conditional on some whatever market definition we're doing, gets you a presumption of illegality. Most people who defend it really mean something like, hey, it's a great litigation tool, helps us win. Well, so is the Robinson-Patman Act, and that's a horrible piece of legislation. I don't think it helps us win. <laughs> right. I mean, you could win every time. I, I, you know, so uh, point being, in merger law, that's sort of my, my big hobby horse. Um, but I think you've got ideas uh, surrounding changes to merger law that sort of go the, other, that go the other way. My view is, and maybe this is a, um, a framing that'll set us up to disagree and have some fun, but my framing is for merger plaintiffs, yes, the agency loses some cases. They just lost a Bonnick, um, you know, they lost ATP Time Warner. They also stipulated to a gazillion dollars of efficiencies. It turns out the way you litigate cases matters too, uh, even though I, I don't think that was a good case. Um, they lose some, they win some, but the agencies win a lot more merger cases than they want. And every time we've got a post-merger share greater than 30, they presumptively win. In only one case in history, have we had 
uh, an efficiencies defense successfully rebut uh, after the plaintiff has sort of satisfied its prima facie burden. One, in history, uh, that's sort of um, where a, a defendant has won on efficiencies defense and a presumption that says it's presumptively lawful above 30%, how easy do you want it? That's sort of my setup to get you to try to fight me. Well, I, I, uh, frankly, I haven't studied whether, whether the PMB uh, presumption is precisely right. I, I'm gonna talk about this at a, at a somewhat more general level because uh, I think it's more interesting and ultimately more important. Um, first of all, I do think there's a lot of evidence that mergers, uh, uh, there's been an enforcement of merger. I'm not saying it's catastrophic, I'm not saying it's a bunch of crooks uh, in the Justice Department, but you know, the, the hospital merger situation is a disaster. Now, partly that's because of uh, inability to win in court, uh, maybe some I mean, say sort of employ analytical tools from there to build it. But the, the result is uh, a pretty unfortunate situation in the hospital department. And then there's, of course, John Quoker's work, which I know some people criticize, but certainly suggested. Uh, of, of problems uh, uh, among uh, mergers that have been cleared and uh, that less resulted, although I didn't expect the price increases uh, and, and so on. And it's part, I think, of a larger, a larger issue in antitrust law. For me, in many ways, the issue is this. Antitrust law, uh, more than any kind of law I know of, maybe it's, maybe I don't know what it is. Um, uh, involves a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, we're making judgments about the unknowable, the future innovation, the unobservable uh, incremental costs. Um, and so I'm necessarily making decisions on the conditions. Now, starting, I suppose, uh, with Easterbrook's article in 1984, uh, antitrust law has, I think, um, uh, clearly and repeatedly and explicitly said, we're more worried about false positives than about false. Now, first of all, that Easterbrook conjecture was never documented. Uh, and it was, it was under-specified even at the beginning because he talked about duration uh, of the error rather than didn't take into account the uh, of the welfare costs. Um, but whether it was correct or not, uh, uh, maybe 40 years ago, there's a lot of reason to think uh, that we ought to read him that. But if you, if you start with the notion that maybe we ought to try to recalibrate that balance between risking false positive and risking false negative, then uh, uh, you might want to say that under some circumstances, emergence are a good example, better, by the way, than Sherman Act cases because the merger law is, is almost entirely a, a specialized agency law. Um, uh, and, and it's a kind of example you do almost entirely, therefore it doesn't have some of the, the incentive problems. Um, uh, one way to address that, that recalibration is to say, you know, under some circumstances and some conditions are met that, that give rise to a concern, not necessarily a belief that if these facts hold, this merger is anti competitive, but a concern that there's a real risk here, then I think it may well be appropriate to say, you know, instead of having the plaintiff, bear the burden of uncertainty, of not being able to prove that the prices were below cost in the AMR, AMR case, even though it's quite obviously worth. Um, why don't we, in those high-risk situations, shift the burden to the defendant and, and, in effect, change the question in the case? Instead of the question being, should we run the risk of a false positive here? The question would become, under certain circumstances, should we run the risk of a false negative? I think that's a perfectly sensible way to conceptualize uh, a, what may be a healthy reform in, in the antitrust laws. And then, of course, that leads us to the very hard question that you're directly addressing, which is, well, is PMB or some other proposed uh, a condition that would, that would create that burden shift, that presumption? Is that the right place to draw the line? Can we? I think I agree. It's a reasonable framework. It's a framework that. You know, I think, um, I mean, error cost for you know, critics of guys who think about the world uh, like I do, error cost has been like a code word of some sort. But, you know, this is decision theory, right? Every, you know, um, about balancing type one and type two errors. Um, and so this is the framework about the acceptable risks and who should bear the burdens that 
you know, guys like me argue, um, you know, the same logic applies to safe harbors, right? If we know conditions that make the, the risk especially low, we heighten the burden, right? And one can think about cases like, um, whether right or wrong on the empirics, like one can think about cases like Brook Group as expressing that type of concern. We know we're gonna get some type two error, but yeah. and we really like price cutting uh, and explicitly citing to the literature to say, we think the risk here is low and so the burden's high, right? I think it, it adopts that kind of logic. I think Trinko does the same. Um, and it's absolutely correct to point out that where economic evidence in theory tells us something is high risk, we should have the burdens of, uh, you know, production reflect that. And sometimes that should mean presumptions, right? So, um, you know, if there were evidence, uh, I read the quota evidence differently, but that's a whole different, a whole different discussion. I think if there were evidence that mergers with a post-merger share over 30, in fact, presented a high risk of harm, I would say the presumption is good. Uh, I think the evidence doesn't say that. And I've actually, I don't think I've ever heard anyone, maybe other than, than Quoka, defend the actual 30% number. I think that's just wrong on the, on the merits of the evidence. Although, I mean, John's done, you know, the work he's put together is really impressive and it's a lot of it and, it, and it's hard. I think, I, I think it's, it's wrong on its interpretation of, of, of results. But I certainly agree with the idea. And let me see if I can get you to agree with the following proposition. Um, because I do think we agree on the framework that when something is high risk, it doesn't have to be certain. But I think in a system where we take the rule of law seriously, um, what about the proposition that uh, we ought to at least be able to substantiate the claim in a colorable way uh, that the conduct at issue or the conditions that we're going to use to trigger the presumption ought to create a risk that harm is more likely than not? Oh, I don't agree with that. Um, I thought you might. I'm going to come back to Trinko in a minute, but let me ask you answer your question first, because it touches upon another area in which I think um, uh, we ought to do some hard thinking. I don't have the solutions for this, but this is important. Um, merge law, I agree, has uh, been uh, uh, come down to to requiring the plaintiff to prove harm more likely than not. That's certainly not some you get from the statutory language, which is not conclusive, but it's true. Um, but it also doesn't strike me as a very good policy standard, unless we have no, no way, as a practical matter, to address what ought to be the right standard, which is what has been called by some a balance of, of harms. I look, I have a different way of framing it. Imagine you're, you're at the beginning of a, course of conduct called an emergency. And you're looking into an uncertain future. And you can imagine that, you know, a sort of a distribution of possible outcomes. Wonderful outcomes, great efficiencies, bad outcomes, and so on. Uh, the current doctrine says you have to, is that the, the question is whether um, the plaintiff uh, can prove uh, uh, that the median is on the law is on the bad side of, of, of things. I think we should be looking for the mean. We should be saying, look, if there are tiny efficiencies here, and as you know, the data show that merger efficiencies are uh, usual I mean, in the aggregate overall are not realized. If there are small efficiency benefits and a potential, even much less than 50-50, but, but non-trivial, of a really bad outcome, then I don't know why in principle. You know, a lot of that merge to go through. So, uh, no, I think that's a fair point. And, and I think that a couple of things as responses, right? I mean, I think one is, um, and I'm gonna we'll sort of bracket the efficiencies uh, discussion for the, for, the, for, for the moment. I think there are lots of mergers that take place for non-antitrust related reasons. Um, the, whether they be, you know, um, I would say economic reasons, you know, the market for corporate control is a real thing. Um, I think there are, you know, Henry Manning's original piece uh, on the market for corporate control uh, because law and economics of corporate law wasn't a hot topic back then. It's sort of framed as an antitrust piece. He says, these antitrust guys are talking about price and output. Uh, aren't they silly? Most of these mergers are really, I mean, the paper is motivated by saying we should think about 
efficiencies in the market for corporate control in an antitrust sense. Now that we barely do what we're doing in a in, in, in a competent way, so I'm not um, not persuaded by that idea. Um, but nor am I persuaded that we ought to be evaluating uh, sort of all mergers um, exclusively their merits that the only merits that count being uh, those that present antitrust efficiencies that are cognizable merger specific as defined by the agencies, um, which I think seem to say now that uh, if you can imagine a contractual way to come up with the efficiencies, the efficiencies don't count um, in, in, in any event. Um, the bigger criticism, I think, of the approach that says, here's a merger with uh, small efficiencies and let's say a 10% likelihood of harm, but on expected value, I, the interesting hypo is the one I think that you put forward, which is expected value is negative, right? Um, expected value from a consumer welfare perspective is negative, but the probability of harm is small. I agree. I think that poses an interesting challenge for the agencies. Um, I think under existing law, um, you got to prove more likely than not. But with respect to the question of whether that should be right, which I think was the question you were raising, I think the major cost to an approach that says that puts, you know, five commissioners or one assistant attorney general um, in charge of deciding whether that merger with a small probability of harm, right? It puts the agency in the place of central planner uh, for all transactions. Um, you know, at some point, I think the uncertainty over regular commerce and business activity associated with agencies saying any risk is enough to prevent a merger, you know, that concerns me watching the way that these decisions get made. Um, in terms of what we challenge and what we don't. I think giving that sort of a discretion to the agency over all transactions, including those we agree are very small risk of any sort of competitive harm, uh, arming them with the tool to do that, I think turns antitrust very quickly into something more like the FCC approval process, where we then get consents that, um, so let me, let me combine the world where the agency can block a merger with any appreciable risk with the world where we get these non-economic concerns floated into antitrust. I mean, very quickly, I think you get um, a regime that looks nothing like the antitrust world we know now, and I don't mean that in a good way. Well, I don't think we have to march that far down the road. I, I agree, we don't have to say that every merger that comes in barely met the reporting thresholds um, and it was an acquisition of a corner drugstore uh, that we should be engaging in the exercise you're talking about. But, but you know, I, I just, you know, I, I don't have the solution to this. But so suppose, for example, you you had a category, uh, you, you said, well, one of the, pre one, not, not the one, one prerequisite before this new um, uh, expected value regime is that one of the firms uh, uh, have monopoly power or close to it in the market in which the merger is feared. Uh, uh, but that would be a filter. And you can have other filters. I don't know what they are, but I mean, I, I, I completely agree. You, you want to have some reasonably objective uh, filters so that you don't get into the kind of uh, subjective, arbitrary decision. I'm weary of time a little bit. I want to shift up to some point talk about um, administrative litigation and this general, I think, issue, uh, I know one you and I have talked about before, uh, and I think it's been in the shadow of some of our discussion up to now about, um, maybe this is the wrong framing, but relative competency of Article Three courts versus specialized agencies and implications for all sorts of things, right? Um, role of administrative litigation, disparate standards between agencies. Uh, one of mine, I know, a, a, a favorite topics, and I know one that you've you've written about as well. But but use of Section Five unfair methods at the FTC. I think sort of all read on this question of of relative competence. Um, also read in a different in a different way. One of the common criticisms of, and it appears in the this house letter, I think it's appeared in some of the open markets themes as well, is um, 
hey, courts can't do this stuff. Either they can't or they don't want to, or the Sherman Act's been hijacked or so something. Um, the Chicago school tricked RBG in, in Trinco. Like, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know how to interpret the, uh, the claims that the, the law has been hijacked by the Chicago school or something like that. But the general view is for whatever reason, antitrust doctrines in an unfriendly place to plaintiffs and we, we can't do enforcement, right? Um, and so the, the courts are the, uh, the body that is not competent to adjudicate these disputes. And so we either need to, through Congress, change that, and that's a, a discussion we, we, we've talked some about already, or um, the other sort of alternatives, if you don't like the courts, is uh, rulemaking. So uh, Commissioner Chopra and Lena Khan have an article saying we gotta, we gotta dust off competition rulemaking and use UMC authority to declare a bunch of bright line rules a la the open markets calls. Um, so that's sort of one possibility. And the other, at least for the FTC and not so much the DOJ, is use of administrative uh, adjudication uh, sort of through the ALJ and in, in, in the commission process. That's a, both of those, but in particular, the administrative adjudication function are something that I've been um, a pretty vocal critic of, uh, especially in the Section 5 standalone UMC context. But even for mergers, I don't see any reason why the FTC can't just go to federal court. Uh, like the DOJ, I think it'd be a better world if they, they both just did that. Um, I'm reminded of this question because not too long ago uh, in Ebonic, maybe, maybe it was just this, this, this week actually, uh, in Ebonic, after taking a loss in the PI proceeding in federal court, the normal course of business is of course the FTC votes to close the part three proceeding. So they had a three, two vote without statements. Um, so no written dissent to say why, but a 3-2 vote to close the administrative proceeding after losing the PI in federal court sort of got some attention uh, about whether there are calls to, uh, or some push inside the agency um, to do more of its merger work through administrative adjudication. So just as a way to sort of tee up that conversation, um, what do you think of the proposition that the discontent with the courts for the current critics of antitrust law are causing a substitution of, intent, of attention and focus into other venues like rulemaking and administrative adjudication. And what do you think about that? Um, why, don't, why don't we start there? Well, I, have, I have an hour and a half for this answer, uh, Josh. It's a big, big I took an hour and a half for the question, so I think that's fair. <laughs> so look, um, the antitrust laws, are laws of general application. They apply to almost all forms of, of business that affects industry. Um, a, a tiny, tiny portion of the law of the uh, commerce is affected, constrained, deterred uh, by the antitrust laws, never sees a court or, or, or an agency. So the first thing I think you have to think about is that we have a body of law here that is both flexible enough and patient enough the view of the broad range of business transactions that the laws cover. And uh, uh, clear enough, not, per, not necessarily in rules, but at least in, in principles and standards, give sufficient guidance to the business community. Um, I think the idea of taking it more and more in the direction of administrative law um, uh, really violates uh, uh, those things uh, because um, it puts uh, the business community at the whim of uh, an agency changing its mind. That's the proper section five. That it, whatever they do, uh, they're either going to have regulations that will be obsolete in about two hours because of evolution in the economy, and then I'll survive like so many regulations in our country um, for various reasons, industry investment lobbying, you know, blood capture. Um, or they're going to have um, uh, a guidance and enforcement actions that will just change with the new composition of the commission. And what we, instead of a, a predictable body of law, we'll have um, an arbitrary application of government power. So I think that's this sort of thing. I'm especially hostile to the idea of administrative adjudication like in part three. Uh, you and I have both written about it from some different perspectives. The data are really quite compelling. The commission, as everyone I'm sure who will be watching this knows, the commission votes out a complaint, then has the so-called uh, ex parte rule, then the case, the case was litigated before an administrative law judge who writes a, a, a recommended decision. 
And then it goes back to the commission, which makes a final decision not having attended the hearing. Um, and it is quite remarkable to me that in every single Sherman Act type case, every one decided on the basis of disputed facts um, uh, since 1984, the commission, when it came back to itself, said, you know, we got it right the first time. I, I've, I've often thought that, that, that as bad as racism is in our country, and it seems to be worse, maybe the most serious uh, bias uh, in, in our culture is confirmation bias. Um, and uh, so we have to have uh, an independent tribunal. It's a, I know from being in the agency, it's a wonderful discipline to, 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 to the prosecutorial judgment in the first instance, and it's a wonderful check against uh, errors and confirmation bias when, when actually it's not. Okay, that raises the question then, of how do we get an independent tribunal? Uh, do we rely on Article Three courts? I think the answer is yes, because are wonderful features, which is why they're in, in the Constitution. They clearly struggle with antitrust. Uh, and some of the decisions you know, we can all point to are just, you know, in favor of their logic. Uh, not any special, the Supreme Court led them down that path, but, but still. Um, uh, so what are the solutions? I think there are two. One, uh, uh, clarify, simplify any trust law, maybe with some of the kinds of presumptions that we talked about. Um, you know, it's a little bit more book group type thing, uh, not just all the defense lawyers. Um, and second, uh, maybe um, expert judges. And I don't mean by that a specialized court like the Federal Circuit, which I think has become kind of intellectually captured. Uh, mm -hmm. My diagnosis, and I'm not an expert in this, is that they spend their whole life trying to make the patent laws internally coherent, but they lost sight of their own role in the bar larger fabric of law in society. So I don't think you want to have a specialized court, but what you could do is, is uh, I think Fiona or Scott Morton have been the first to suggest this, is you could have um, uh, a handful of, I don't know, a dozen judges, whatever the number might be, who would be assigned antitrust duty for, say, 50% of their docket for five years or 10 years. And they get a lot of learning by doing expertise. They wouldn't be isolated like a specialized court, and it wouldn't be a permanent assignment. Maybe that would be a way to, 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 to the Article III courts to up their game, consistent with the broader and I think important principles of, uh, of the by the independent of the Constitution. Judge Ginsburg and I wrote an article in the Antitrust Law Journal some years ago making a proposal sort of precisely along those lines. Maybe, um, maybe uh, Fiona will have more luck getting, uh, getting it picked up. Um, well, maybe she should have credited you. I don't remember. I don't know where she got the idea. Uh, well, I'm sure, I'm sure Judge and I weren't the first uh, to, yeah. to, to suggest as much. But uh, for some reason, there does not seem to be too much appetite um, for do for doing so, and interestingly, I think in uh, in data that I've seen on the the sort of federal court, one of the interesting things I've seen in terms of uh, you know demand from the federal bench for for that sort of expertise. I mean, one thing you do is you set up you know you set up that sort of tri tri tribunal, but even in terms of exercising authority to sort of ask for an independent expert, um, that's this happened a couple of times in antitrust cases. Uh, compare that to patent, sort of another area where people look at and say, ah, that's complicated. I need an independent expert um, to come explain to me the technology or what have you. Um, this almost never happens in cases in front of Article Three antitrust judges, uh, judges with antitrust cases. It's just, um, you know, maybe uh, the difference between, you know, sort of refusal to admit they need help with economics is different than refusal to admit they need help with uh, electrical engineering or something like that. Well, well, there's an additional feature here. Antitrust is the only body of law that I'm aware of in which economic thinking is embedded in legal doctrine. Now, obviously, Brooke Group would be a classic example. There are many, many others. Um, and that puts a special strain on the courts. I, one of my many, many, many criticisms of the American Express um, uh, is that uh, uh, they dabbled in economics. They made a lot of economic statements, some of which are just plain wrong. But even that debate aside, they proclaimed ex cathedra legal rules in spite of the fact that there's no judicial experience. This is a case of first impression. The economic in, uh, uh, profession was not uh, settled on what the right rules were. 
there wasn't an appropriate uh, humility about precisely the thing you're talking about, which is how do the courts take advantage of expertise uh, in a wise way? And I would say in antitrust, it's, a, it's especially challenging because it's embedded in doctrine. It's not just expert testimony about matters of fact. And in a common law discipline, they ought to be humble and cautious when they do that. Um, but they're tough issues. An imperfect, uh, an imperfect institution in which to adjudicate cases, but maybe uh, imperfect while simultaneously better than administrative adjudication in front of the agencies is sort of my, my view. I think like a tolerance for, um, I mean, this debate over competence of the judiciary reminds me historically, um, one of the differences between, say, uh, Borkin and Easterbrook and sort of the, the earlier battles over, over antitrust laws, I mean, you can find in reading you know, Antitrust Paradox, for example, you can find hints and themes and some right, sometimes outright um, sort of explicit claims that, you know, the judiciary is incompetent to do the sort of economic analysis and uh, Folks who don't like efficiencies defenses are very are very fond of citing Bork and Posner, who at the time said, "Let's not do an efficiencies defense." Of course, their argument was because we should make it really hard to satisfy the plaintiff's prima facie burden, and judges shouldn't do balancing. But, you know, um, not because they thought mergers should be presumptively unlawful. Um, and the toolkit for evaluating mer the economic effects was a lot different in the '70s than it is is now. But you could find that thread in Bork's work and not so much in, in, in Easterbrook's, uh, for example. But it is interesting to watch now that the sort of shoe is on the other foot in these debates, as uh, tends to happen with these big uh, sort of intellectual cycles, is that it is the, um, uh, the open markets crowd for sure, and sort of some of the more progressive crowd trying to sort of make um, change antitrust institutions in the direction of more enforcement. Uh, that is finding itself dissatisfied with the competence of the courts. I think the trouble with that is um, the compared to what question is really is really difficult um, because it, it ain't the agencies. Um, what possible solution is bright line rules? Uh, but I think at some point, um, and I'm very hopeful that the antitrust discourse and the marketplace for ideas ends up being a um, sort of uh, issue by issue debate over what presumptions and bright line rules make sense and based on the evidence. Uh, I very much hope that that's the case because um, I think that that is likely the way, you know, honest discussion and evidence about those things is likely the way they way forward. But um, to circle us back to where we started, I'm, I'm not sure that that's as much, uh, as much as you and I would like it to be the debate. I'm not sure it's got the, uh, the mind share that it should at the moment. Well, it's not gotten the, the public attention and the and polemicists, including elected officials. Elected officials. Uh, when the heavy lifting is done, uh, maybe we'll have, have more success. I do think this was a, a, a kind of final note, following up on what you said. That if you look at the, at, for example, the, the, the history, the recent history of the rule of these, you know, plaintiffs almost never win. Um, and that could be because the cases are crappy, but it could be because um, uh, the kinds of factual matters plaintiffs would be expected to include now, given the human limitations and, and, and eligibilities of the institutions, the courts, and the judges, um, uh, is, um, uh, however, theoretically correct, the, the principles might be, um, as a practical matter, it's just law to try to favor. And that's the question that we ought to have a serious conversation. Well, I invited you here, so um, I will leave you with the last word. I know we're, we, went, we went a little bit over what I promised, but, uh, but uh, I'm glad you uh, got, to, got to see you virtually and, uh, and, got to, and got to chat. Anything you want to close us out with? Well, I just want you to know, you should know that there was a person who looked a great deal like Doug Ginsburg who was using your name on a, uh, a big uh, uh, antitrust chat group yesterday, or Zoom group, I'm sure, I know you know what that's about. Yeah, well, you know, if anybody gets to use my name, it's, 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 it's anywhere he wants, any way he wants, it's the judge. So it could, could have been worse. <laughs> well, thanks, Doug, and uh, okay. we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Jordan.